So welcome everyone. Welcome to the Zoom program we're having this evening. Uh, my name is Roman Bratiak. I'm the program chair for Santa Barbara Audubon Society. Um, hello to everyone. Hopefully there are folks from out of town as well. It's great to have you with us. We're gonna start off. I'm gonna introduce the president of the board of directors of Santa Barbara Audubon Society, Janice Lemeshev. Janice. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Roman. Uh, Good evening, everybody. We're excited to share this evening with you and Jay Shepard. Uh, a few announcements. Um, our bird walk at North Campus Open Space, which is scheduled for Friday, has been canceled due to 90% chance of rain Friday morning. Uh, as this is also a reminder that for status on all of our bird walks and field trips, especially when the weather is uncertain, please check our website for the latest. Uh, we wish to thank the newsletter team of Colette Becker and Dennis Power. Uh, the electronic version of our latest newsletter is now available on our website. Uh, for those of you who prescribe to subscribe to the paper version, you should see your copies in a couple of weeks, maybe sooner. Um, Hugh Ranson's latest column on um, Cats and birds are not a good mix, uh, is in the independent. It just got published uh, the other day. So please check it out. And that's it for the announcements. So now I'll turn it back over to Roman to introduce our speaker. Okay, great. Thank you, Janice. I feel like we should be on a talk show or something like that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read my introduction. So apologies that I'm reading it, but. Uh, this way, hopefully, I won't stumble as much. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us for this special Zoom talk by Jay Shepard. We're extremely grateful to Jay for his willingness on short notice to deliver this talk. And we're particularly thankful that he has also kindly deferred a speaking fee for the presentation, which will allow us to use those funds to further our advocacy, programming, and educational initiatives. Also, many, many thanks to Jay, who's currently in Maryland, for staying up late this evening to deliver the talk and to answer questions from the chat. I'd also like to thank Mark Holmgren, a member of our Conservation and Science Committee, for connecting us to Jay and helping make this event possible. Uh, I'd like to also just briefly mention three uh, free public programs that are coming up this spring. They are on Wednesday, March 22, Something to Crow About, Stories and Biology of Crows, Ravens, Jays, and Magpies. This is also a Zoom talk. The presenter is avian behavioral ecologist Kaylee Swift from the University of Washington. Then on Wednesday, April 19th, we'll host an in-person talk by science writer Rebecca Heisman in the Faulkner Gallery at the Downtown Central Library. Rebecca's talk is titled Flight Paths, How a Passionate and Quirky Group of Pioneering Scientists Solved the Mystery of Bird Migration. It's an illustrated lecture based on her soon to be released book due out across the country in March. The event's co-presented with the Santa Barbara Public Library. And then our May event will be presented also in person by avian biologist David Perexta on Wednesday, May 24, in Farron Hall at the Museum of Natural History. It is titled Pelagic Birding Off Southern California, Searching in the Open Ocean. Uh, all three of those events are at 7.30 p.m. and they're all free. So hope you can join us at all of them. The format for this evening's presentation will be as follows. Jay will deliver his lecture titled Chasing a Desert Apparition, LeConte's Thrasher, and then answer your questions submitted via the chat. Please mute yourself during the lecture and remain so throughout the program. And do use the chat function to submit a question. You can do that at any time. Our speaker this evening, Jay Shepard, is a retired ornithologist from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. He worked for a number of years at the Bird Banding Laboratory located at Patuchent, I'm going to glue it. Uh, wildlife uh, Research Refuge in Maryland. 
and later in the Endangered Species Program Office in Washington, DC. He will discuss some of the challenges and results of his study of Lacan's Thrasher, a little study species found in the hottest and driest deserts of the American Southwest and Northwestern Mexico. Jay has spent years studying this enigmatic bird and gives the results of his study with some insight into its daily life. For those of you wanting to learn more about the life history of this bird, Jay's monograph, title of The Biology of a Desert Apparition, Lacan Th uh, Thrasher, which was published in 2018. You can find a link to it at the Santa Barbara Audubon website by going to the event listing for this talk. Also, if you have friends or family that are unable to zoom in this evening, the talk is being recorded and will be available for future viewing at our website. It'll take a few days to get the talk posted, so be patient. And many thanks to Jay for giving us permission to do that and to David Levishev for posting it and for being our amazing webmaster again this evening. So with that, I'm pleased to present Jay Shepherd. Oh, thank you, Roman. I uh, appreciate that introduction. I didn't realize I'd done all that. I guess after a few years, you forget some things. <laughs> but at any rate, I'm really happy to be in Santa Barbara, even though I'm sitting here in uh, central Maryland, not far from Annapolis. And it's about to rain here. I understand it's about to start raining there in Santa Barbara. So uh, similar weather, 3,500 3, miles apart. Uh, uh, it's uh, a real honor and a pleasure to just to talk to people in California about a bird that I hope most of you have had a chance to at least look for. Uh, I was going to ask for everybody to raise their hands who has seen the bird, uh, but I my Zoom arrangement here, I can't, I don't think I can see everybody, but uh, how many of you think you've seen it, been able to watch it continuously for more than 40 or 50 minutes at a time. Yeah, I don't see many hands at this point. Uh, at one point in my study, uh, I found a pair that I had been watching for actually about four years at that point. And I found their nest that they were had young in. I could stand there right out in the open, put my hand on the nest at any moment, and the birds kept coming back and forth, back and forth, feeding the young and caring less that I was standing, you know, five, five feet tall above their nest. And uh, so they're really a enigmatic uh, <laughs> species. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sometimes I'd find the nest and wouldn't even see the bird for a day or two. I'd, every time I got up to the nest, it had slipped off. And sometimes I could even hear the metal plastic bands jingling on its legs. So I knew it was banded, but didn't know who it was. Uh, the scene behind me is actually, uh, you're gonna see another view of the same area. This is right almost in the dead middle of the study area near Maricopa. So without further ado, let's see if we can share uh, our little program here. Okay. I think uh, this is an uh, applicable title uh, because the thrasher is often just seen for a few minutes and then seems to vanish into thin air, not like, unlike a magician on an open stage that can pull one bunny after another out of a hat or, or make a lady disappear uh, right before your eyes. It, these birds, I don't know how they do it, it do it, but, uh, they can be a little hard to see at times. Uh, just the way the the uh, credits are given at the bottom left, if the photograph is not mine. So if you're interested in who the photographer was. Uh, it's considered by most species an observer, by most observers to be a very shy and retiring species. It's hard to find and glimpse. And even once you find it, it's gonna vanish fairly quickly at times. You and your buddies can go out and go across a fairly open space and think, oh, hey, we just found a bird. It's right there under the bushes. And a few seconds later, it's gone out of, the, out of sight. 
because it saw you or something happened. I've seen it hide right behind a very small shrub like this one is doing. And most, most observers, bird watchers, get to see the south end of a north running Leconte Thrasher with its tail held, held up high. I never measured its time spent on the ground versus flying, but it, it's gotta be 95% or 98% of the time it's on the ground or in a shrub. Uh, it just does not fly very much. A true apparition of the desert. You notice where this was recorded uh, at Maricopa, but it was about almost 50 years after I did my study, so there was no chance of it being banded. Nice little song. He's he's not trying to tell the world where he is. He's thinks there was another male nearby, and he's just checking to see. So he's singing louder and louder. The basic facts, as earlier alluded to, it's found only in the hottest driest portions of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. It weighs just a little over two ounces, uh, it rarely drinks, and normally doesn't even see surface water, except only in the winter, and even then it's pretty uncommon. Its habitat preferences are relatively, are relatively flat terrain with a scattered shrubbery, few over five feet, uh, open, mostly sandy soils, or deep sandy soils, with uh, prefers choyas and salt bushes for most of its nesting. So if you can find all those together, that tends to be a good area to look for the const thrashers. Here's the lowest point in North America, Death Valley. In fact, the white patch in the back at the foot of those mountains is the actual bottom floor of Death Valley, minus 281 feet, I believe, uh, below sea level. These uh, mesquite and other shrubs uh, around the perimeter are inhabited by the thrasher. Uh, this picture was taken in the wintertime, so the lady did have to wear a jacket. But in the summertime, the dawn temperature at this point rarely gets below 100 or 105. And the afternoon temperatures often are above 120. So this is a pretty warm place. And the nearest fresh water, I, 20 miles, 40 miles, I don't know what the nearest fresh water might be. Long ways. They like sand dunes like the Algodones in southeastern California, especially if it has a little bit of vegetation like these little smoke trees. Uh, the mesquite of northwestern uh, Arizona, not an abundant bird in this area. Same in the southwestern Arizona, same sort of scattered habitat, There's scattered shrubs in the same sort of habitat, flat, gravelly, sandy soils. I think everybody knows where Phoenix and Tucson are. Phoenix has, or did have before the development, uh, 150 years ago, uh, Lacan Strashers. Tucson has never had them, uh, at least not near the city. And this is Casa Grande, which is about halfway between the two. And this is about the southern, southeastern limit of Lacan Strasher. It does not like that big, heavy uh, microfill desert flora that you see in the background, especially. It's just too dense. There's too much competition with the other thrashers, uh, Curvebill, Crystal, and, and uh, Bendires. It's limited by precipitation. Anything over eight inches is usually too much. You add water and the bird disappears. Uh, maximum mean 
annual snowfall is about six inches. Just can't dig through more than that and its food gets covered. The maximum elevation is 5,900 feet. And that was just on the west side of Death Valley itself. Here's the upper, not far upper end of uh, Death Valley near Lone Pine and Bishop showing the scattered uh, salt bushes. Those are the Inyo or White Mountains, I guess, in the background. Here's in the heart, the dead middle of the Mojave Desert out by Baker. And this is a very typical thrasher habitat. They're not very abundant here. You can see a few salt bushes in the little draw just in the immediate uh, background uh, behind that choy on the left. Uh, out in Joshua Tree, uh, near uh, Joshua Tree National Park, the little communities out there, a lot of people have planted their houses on little ranchettes with, I don't know the size of the ranchettes, 10, 20 acres, and they've left the natural vegetation and the thrashers still nest in their choyas right around these homes. And uh, one lady was feeding them mealworms and had them coming right into her uh, backyard, or in fact, right under her porch. Uh, there is some audio here, but it it's I can't improve it anymore. It's just the very low chirping of these birds. But they will come into people's yards. They're, they're not shy when, when they find food. Here's the historic range of the species. It is extirpated over a fair number of areas. The, a whitewater area out past Riverside and San Bernardino towards Palm Springs is virtually devoid of thrashers, and that used to be a major area for them uh, 100, 125 years ago. The big red star is the south end of the San Joaquin Valley where my study area was at Maricopa. I want to add an interesting spot. You see the little black star up near the very top of the of this uh, illustration. That's a brand new, just recently discovered population isolated by almost 100 miles uh, from the nearest other thrashers. We don't really know much about it. Uh, there's apparently a half a dozen or a dozen pairs in this deep valley uh, that doesn't get the snow because it's such a low elevation. Notice the isolated population on the west coast of Baja down in the center. And that's sometimes considered a separate species. I'm not totally persuaded that it is. In the Thrasher study I started in 68 through 71. It was an 1800 acre study area just right next to Maricopa. In the area I had 35, 40 pairs producing about 130 young each year. All the nestlings and most of the adults were color banded each year. This is the culprit that started the study. This is a male of a pair that I actually banded in the spring of early, uh, late winter of 1967. The pair was found the following year and that's what instigated the study. I said, boy, the same bird, male and female, are together at the same spot where they had nested the previous year. Uh, that's interesting. Let me look around, and within a week, I had discovered there were dozens of pairs in the immediate vicinity of this pair. And so I started banding and color banding them at that point. Unfortunately, the female of this pair, after four nesting that we know of, four nesting seasons with this male, got hit by a car. Uh, just outside Maricopa, where this pair was. But this male was still alive the last uh, I did a survey in spring of 1971. So it went through at least five breeding seasons. The very first nest that I found in the study and the last nest of 166 was with this male. This is the odd shape of the actual 1800 acre study area. Uh, the reason it was mostly that odd shape, you can see the little white lines 
running around through the desert. Those are roads. They were gravel, dirt, sand, uh, but very easy to travel over. And it gave me access to virtually every place in the study area. I only had maybe a 200 yard, 300 yard hike away from any one of those roads to get to some spot that wasn't accessible by the by my van. So those roads were the main, plus the high density of the thrashers. The little donut here in the middle, and it was an area that was cleared by the miners uh, looking for minerals uh, 10 or 20 years before I did the study. And it was devoid of everything, no vegetation, no nothing. So I essentially excluded it from all parts of the study. Well, let me go back a second here. You see the little X mark or the cross mark right there with the C beside it. Uh, you'll see it again, but it won't be as visible, uh, unfortunately, in the next uh, couple of slides later. But just remember that little spot. I'll refer to it later. This is what one of the color banded uh, thrashers looked like. Uh, <laughs> I actually avoided taking pictures of banded thrashers. I had been sort of mentored by wildlife photographers and they didn't want anything unnatural in the picture. So I, I kept such pictures uh, out of my slide repertoire. Here's the west side of the study area. The salt bushes in this area were very short, a little over knee high, and the thrashers rarely could nest in any of them. But they did like to feed in them, the, especially the juveniles in the late summer. There was plenty of food under them that just no places for them to roost and nest. Okay, the uh, nesting in late January into middle of June, and they lay two to five eggs per clutch with an average a little over three. Uh, the pairs make two or three nest attempts each season, and incubation lasts approximately 16 days, and the nestling period is another 16 days. The males take care of the young after they fledge for the next 20 days after they're leaving the nest. And at that point, the female immediately starts building a new nest and laying eggs and starting incubation. So while the male's taking care of the young, the female's building a new nest. And I'll show you some more about that in a little bit. Actually, I had one, just to give you an idea how fast this occurs, had uh, one pair, for example, flesh fledge on a Saturday morning. By the following Saturday morning, that female was incubating four eggs in a new nest, totally new nest. Uh, they never, as far as I could tell, reused an old nest. Uh, maybe years later, they might build something on top of it, but I wouldn't call that reuse. They just liked the platform that was left at that point. Here are some nest sites on the left are some arroyo uh, nest sites where the salt bushes were falling over the side or still growing on the sides. The thrashers really like those. They frequently find two or three, four nests, old nests in just one of those shrubs. If you look at C and D, excuse me, E, down at the very bottom, those are pictures of the arroyo that were, those most frequently used by these thrashers. On the right side is an, an abandoned road grader. If you look at the top picture. If you look at the vegetation around this road grader, it was like that earlier picture, very short vegetation and pretty unsuitable for nesting thrashers. So the thrashers built in every nook and cranny that they could find in, under, and around uh, this old piece of equipment. I, the bottom picture, I pulled a seat off the top, off its mount, and underneath the seat was that nest. The, the middle picture is another nest that was just on top of the gas tank, if I remember that particular nest. From a sample of almost 700 nest records, uh, including this, my 160 some odd in Maricopa, 82% of all nests were in just choya, cactus, or salt bush. Notice that man-made structures ranked, quote, 
number four, but uh, it's still a 2%. That's not too shabby a number. This is just a quick look at the, again, a piece of the study area showing the locations of the nests. The road grader you'll see right over in the upper left corner of the study track, the little RG road grader. And uh, you will see that most of these are lined up along the arroyos. Here's a nest we were studying intensively. We opened up and there's a thrasher tail. There are only three times a thrasher sits up on top of a bush. One is to sing. And the other two times is after it's deposited some material for its new nest, it will often come up to the top of the nest, the top of the bush, and look around and then fly off. Or after it is fed young, it will hop up on top of the nest, look around, and then fly off. So if you see a thrasher sitting on top of a shrub and it's not singing, it just it'll only be there probably 30 seconds or maybe a minute and flies off, that's a good place to look for a nest. It's a real tell. Uh, this is the main reason I, I realized a few years after I finished the study that the San Joaquin Valley does not have any choya cactus. I'm really, really happy. If I had to reach my hand into that nest and pull out the young, weigh them, put them back, pull them out again a few days later, weigh them again, put the bands on, put them back in. My hands would have been bloody every, you know, I'd, I'd have gone through cases of band-aids. Uh, some social facts that I learned from the color banded birds is nearly all pairs remain mated for life. Out of 54 pair bonds where I could identify both individuals, only two did the adults split and remate stay alive and remate with two new, new uh, mates. So it's a pretty high percentage. Uh, new pairs could form. I had one pair form in less than a day. Uh, and I can't get into all the details of how that happened, but sometimes they would stay single for several months before they would find another mate. Except for the mate and its own fledglings of that last brood, the adults do not mix with any other thrasher. They are not social animals. However, the juveniles in their very first summer form little bands and roam around the, the desert uh, somewhat uh, like teenagers after school roaming through a mall. If you have either know that or have heard of that uh, phenomenon, I don't remember having malls when I was a kid, but at any rate. Some other thrasher uh, facts of interest. Their nesting territories vary from between 10 and 30 acres. Now here in the east, a robin and a song sparrow and other songbirds, their territories are maximum of about a half acre. That is really a large territory. Some uh, house wrens and other little birds Sometimes they're only two tenths of an acre. So this is a very large territory. Uh, the same pair over years may utilize up to about 75 acres of habitat. Not all at once, just accumulate uh, use. The typical density, I, I did a lot of surveys out in other parts of its range in the United States. Uh, Arizona, Southern California, uh, Mojave Desert, and on into Nevada and Utah. And the typical density that I could find there was two to 15 birds per square mile with sometimes zero, but most often probably four or five is probably the typical number per square mile, 640 acres. If you ever walked across a square mile, section. But at Maricopa, just blundered into this spot, the average density was about 30 adults per square mile. And that was the highest I've ever found, although I did find 
like up at McKittrick, if anybody knows where that area is, north of Taft, on further north of Maricopa, and some other couple places in the uh, excuse me, the Mojave Desert, where there's probably an equal density. But I haven't found anything or heard of anybody finding any higher density. It is totally non-migratory. Uh, there's no migration. They will wander, especially when they're unattached and single. But I'll explain that a little more of that later. Here's that same area that's the backdrop of my uh, presentation. This is uh, Elkhorn Grade Road, and uh, I can't remember the route numbers, 133 and uh, whatever. Doesn't make any Maricopa is in the background. If you were coming from Santa Barbara to Maricopa, this is the road you would be, the pavement there in the, in the far background would be the pavement you would be driving. This was an area frequented by one pair for three successive nesting seasons. The outer boundary line that you see there it encompasses about 30, 35 acres. And that's the only area that I ever saw those two marked adult thrashers. I never saw them across the road, never saw them outside that boundary. The little, the little red symbols that you see there are the various nest sites that they used over the three years. The sites may look somewhat clustered but in most cases, those were successive year usages in the same general vicinity of the other nests. So they did produce, actually they produced one uh, albino type leucistic bird on the, one of the very first broods that I would monitor. So I was interested in how close they, pairs would nest. They would tolerate another pair. The average was only about 400 yards with a range of 150 to 725. I was also interested in their territoriality, which is how much defense they will put up uh, over real estate. Will they defend a small area or a large area? And how does that vary over the course of the year? This is a not a graph based on real data, although it has a basis in fact. The left vertical axis is the response rate. High means that if a bird hears your recording, uh, it's gonna come from three or 400 yards to investigate you and probably display right where you are. You don't have to chase it, it will come to you. The low, on the other hand, you have to be right beside the nest within 30 yards, or actually 30 feet, excuse me, 30 feet of the nest or the bird itself. During the molt in the summer, it goes to a low level too. What happens is it's very high at the very beginning of the calendar year. It lays its first clutch E and immediately forgets about defending anything but the immediate vicinity of its nest until it starts its second nest, the second E, and, and continues on to the third nest if it makes one. And then during the summer, it basically only defends the area within a short distance around it, wherever it happens to be at that particular moment. So occasionally you can see adult thrashers maybe 50 yards apart feeding quietly, but if either one of them gets up and starts making any sort of noise, or which usually is pretty unusual in the summer, uh, they don't interact. Then, then towards the end of September, usually there's a brief cool spell. Instead of the high 90s, temperatures will drop maybe into the low 70s. Wow, woo. And the birds will get up and start singing a little bit in the morning or maybe the evening. And then uh, it warms back up again and they sort of stop doing whatever they were singing and until we finally get at the first rain, maybe in October if we're lucky. And then maybe around Thanksgiving, we get another rain. And by that time, they're really hot to trot and they're really defend, it's cooler now. And uh, the birds are really high territorial behavior. They will, come from three or 400 yards to 
chase down your sound recording. I was interested in the distance from between nests, that is a pair builds a nest, fledges or loses the nest from predation or whatever, and then the next nest that they build, what are the, what, how far do they move? Is it just a few feet or is it a great distance? I was also interested in the difference between the, the pairings, if the same pair, how far they moved uh, and whether the female, how far she moved after she loses her male mate and vice versa, how the male, how far he moves after he loses the female. Now, this is also not just within one nesting season, but from one nesting season to the next. You saw that earlier picture where all the nests were sort of clustered in the same 30 acres. So you can see what the, probably what the data is going to look like. So here's the same pair, which is basically what I, that green uh, lush uh, desert picture that I showed with the boundary and the little nest sites. But you see the first 400 yards, 400 meters, almost all the nests are clustered there with the same male and female paired together. I had one out at one kilometer. That was an exception. There's always exception to every rule. Now we're here, we're looking at the blue bars are the males and where they made their next nest with their new female mate. And you can see it's basically a mirror, smaller because of smaller sample size of the same pair data. Now let's take a look at the females. Oh, a little different here. Now they're scattered out. Some are still back where they had been before, but there's a lot more movement out and away from where that territory, where their previous nest had been. Now this can be in the same nesting season, or it could be the next nesting season. So you can see out to three or four kilometers, two or three miles, here's the, the actual measurements. And you can see that the same pair and the males who lost their female mate have basically the same movement for about 200 meters uh, between nest sites. But the females, the bottom there in the red, uh, that's 720 meters, three times what the other birds were doing. So why is that? Well, the females can slip through all the other territories of those males that are out there, no matter what time of the year it is, and not be harassed. Well, they'll probably be harassed, but they can slip through and keep on going. But if a male tries to move, He's got neighbors and they will hem him in and they will not let him go past. So essentially he's locked in to wherever he settled. Nest of the thrashers. You see how dense in the salt bushes these nests can be. We studied that uh, nest that had the hole in the side of the salt bush uh, for a day and we wanted to see who was doing all the feeding and another important tasks at the nest. And you can see the columns there for the males and females for a number of feeding trips, and then who removed most of the fecal sacs. And if you look at down at the very bottom row there, the male is doing 60 to 70% of the work for feeding and removal of fe fecal sacs. But now let's take a look at the right column, the uh, brooding time. The females do most of the brooding in actual minutes. We were able to you know, calculate. We had a microphone on this nest. So we know exactly when a bird arrived at the nest and when it left the nest. There was always a, a little flutter, flutter, or scratch, scratch or something we could hear in the microphone. Um, so you can see the males, they did hardly any brooding. But he's taking care of the, the most of the feeding trips. Actually, this particular male spent the previous night and the night after this day on the nest. So he was brooding at night before and after this particular study when we started before first light and we ended after the male gone and sat on the nest. 
I, I bring up this particular picture because it does show an interesting feature of the contractor nests. They have a second inner lining. It's usually made out of plant material, soft uh, uh, leaves and other sorts of material. I, I never quite analyzed all of it. Uh, when it gets wet and aged a little bit, it's almost like uh, paper mache. And some people have likened it when they see it to mattress ticking, if anybody knows what mattress ticking looks like. Well, in fact, this is mattress ticking. This particular nest was located at the city dump of Maricopa, and somebody had left a mattress out on the desert, uh, and these thrashers discovered a hole in the side of the mattress and thought they hit pay dirt. So this nest is actually lined with <laughs> mattress ticking. We still don't have any idea why they do it. I know of no other bird in the desert that puts that kind of a line, second lining. The first lining is a typical grass uh, and rootlets and other fine, very fine material woven in a nice cup. But then they add this second layer down inside that. And it's very distinctive. Uh, you, you find a LeConte Thrasher nest anywhere, and you know you found a LeConte Thrasher nest, even when it's two or three years old. I was interested with these all these banded birds. I was interested in the dispersal of these nestlings. Where did they go over the course of their first year of life? So here's a graph while they're being cared for by their parents of their first 30 days of life. So it's really only 15 days, or two, a little over two weeks out of the nest. I just sort of arbitrarily cut it off at 30 days. And you can see they're right stay close to their natal nest, which is also, if you remember the nesting uh, distances, is basically the same as where the parents were too. They were staying close to the previous nest. Now from 30 days, 31 days of age, till the end of the nesting season, uh, the solid bars are young that are independent. They're not being fed by the adults. Uh, still had a couple, few birds that were still being fed at that early age. But you can see the birds are just starting to spread out a little bit. The top graph is from the end of the nesting season till the end of September, uh, which is before the birds start, the adults become territorial. And you can see I've got a beautiful bell curve there. If somebody think I jerry-rigged that, I, I'm sorry, it just came out that way. Uh, but uh, notice after the end of September, from October through December, the birds just go all different directions from that peak of about one kilometer uh, in the middle of the summer. And they now go in all directions. And some will go out almost four kilometers, two and a half miles. This is the distribution of the distance from their natal nest to their very first nest, the next, their first breeding season, their next next year. And you can see the average is, yeah, a little over a, a kilometer, but there's some clear out there, as I mentioned, four kilometers, two and a half miles. The birds do fly, not very much, but they do fly. And remember that little cross mark that I was mentioning earlier? It's just barely visible there above the red arrow, uh, the center point for my graphs that you're going to be looking at. But I want you to look at the, the arm of the track going to the southwest, to immediate south of the red arrow, and then up to the north and northeast and to the east from that point. So you get a reference of where the city is to the northwest of that, because everything's gonna be graphed from that point. All my nests and where I saw a banded bird was recorded from that point. So the center of this graph is that little point. Notice my caveat in the upper left corner. These dotted lines are not the route of travel. We have no idea. They just simply connect the dots uh, 
the birds could have gone to Hollywood or Santa Barbara or Goleta and then come back for all I know between these observations. So here I have three females, it just happened to be females, uh, from one nest in May of 68. And the first banded bird, uh, this is where it went from the red is the May 68 nest and it went down to the Southeast, but I didn't see it again until February of 69 where it did nest. The second bird went to the Southwest, about the same, almost a little further than the first uh, sibling. And it nested and spent its time in the spring of, of 69 down there. And of course, it's the last one that always does the most. And this one, I got some observations of it in its first summer. And you see the September 1968, that's as far as east as it went. There's an August 68 and July 68 triangle right there all together. So it spent that fairly short distance, not too far from the its natal nest. Uh, but then it went back to the west of its natal nest and nested in February of 69. Then it lost its mate shortly after it, that first nest and was seen uh, going back down and followed along. And then finally in October of 69, it was in the same area where it spent its first summer. That was the last observation I have for that. I have over a thousand observations like this. This is just a sample of one nest where I had, so then they all started from the same nest. I have, you take a hundred nests and plot all of them. It, it looks a pretty messy graph. So that's why I picked this particular nest. And here are two males from a nest the following year that I was able to track. Uh, this one uh, from April 68, the, one of the birds within a month after leaving the nest, it was down due south, almost two kilometers, 2000 yards. Uh, but then it went back up and ended up just southeast of its nest uh, in February of 1970. And of course it's the last bird banded Again, uh, this bird went way down to the Southwest, poked around there for its first summer. And then I didn't see it again until the following February. And it was up just actually just outside the outskirts of Maricopa. And then saw it again in February of 71 and then moved a little bit more. Wow, vocalizations. Thrashers, mockingbirds, all in the family Mimidae are noted for their vocalizations. But when you go out to look for them, they usually aren't singing much. They do sing, but it's not as much as you would think uh, or hope. The call that almost every bird watcher does hear when they're out in the area of uh, thrashers is this contact call. It is very loud. It carries for maybe 800 yards on a, on a calm day. You could probably hear it at half a mile. So the three separate calls. And as I mentioned, uh, obviously you're only listening to me, not the song, the calls. Uh, there was a foreshortened just for the graphic purposes uh, of this presentation and uh, normally are 10 to 60 seconds apart. Uh, this, those intervals were uh, shortened just to put it on those on that graph. Now let's take a look at the song. So that that was the contact call. Very, it's the most conspicuous part of the a bird. Actually, you hear that and may not even see the bird if you're ever out in its habitat. Here's a sonogram of one little song, 43 second, I think it was. And all the little boxes, I'll have to explain a little bit of this. The little boxes are phrases that I identified uh, to compare with each other and with other songs of the same bird and with other songs of other males. I was curious to see if there was any 
particular phrases or group of phrases that all the constructors sing at some point. And that turned out to be a big zero negative. Uh, there are none that I can find. And then I was interested in, well, how much do they repeat each of these little phrases within their song called repetition rate? And I want you to listen to this song. You follow, there's going to be a, it's not going to be a bouncing ball like we used to watch, at least when I was a kid on TV, but you'll follow the arrow and you will actually see the sound being made as you hear it. Sound, okay? Okay, how much of that do you think is duplicate phraseology, if you would call it that? Let me show you some of the some of the duplicate uh, uses of the same phrase. The little at the top row there, starting with the little blue triangle with the yellow border and the purple triangle. Notice they are in that order together. Down at, in the third row on the left. They are repeated again, but in a reverse order. Red apple, apple red. I don't know what they're saying. The second row, you see a red triangle and a few phrases, and then a green triangle. Down at the very end of the whole song on the bottom right, uh, you see them repeated again, but there's no intermediate phrases. Uh, oh, I forgot the uh, the green triangles with the red border, didn't I? <laughs> and you see they're duplicated and they're doubled uh, there in the first row, but down on the fourth row at the very left is a single. Didn't double it. So out of 72 phrases, 22 were repeated. And so 70% so uh, unique and 30% doubled or duplicate i shouldn't say doubled sometimes they they might repeat one phrase two or three times some songs might go two or three minutes this is only 43 seconds fairly short song actually uh using a, a lot of different songs different males trying to estimate the number of unique phrases that each male might have the very very raw minimum is 200 per male but that's almost absurd, but that's just the math speaking, not biology. Uh, the maximum number might be an infinite number. I think that's a little too far in the opposite direction. The realistic number in my estimation is several thousand, but even every year, the male is adding another 100 or 200 or maybe more phrases to his repertoire. Some of these phrases are probably handed down over dozens, if not hundreds of generations of thrashers or other birds in the area. And they are then mutate, change uh, by the new uh, acquisitioner of that particular sound. So who knows uh, where some of these sounds came from. We actually took some song tapes and played them at half speed. And we could actually hear other birds, other species that uh, were being mimicked at the half speed of the thrashers. So in other words, the thrashers appeared to be doubling the speed of the sparrows and mockingbirds and sage thrashers and other birds that were in the immediate area. We thought it rather amusing at the time. Really no, other than our ears, we don't can't say anything more than that. Uh, one of the unique things about 
thrashers and mockingbirds and other members of this family is they have two syringes uh only a few other groups of birds have that i don't know of any there probably is a mammal group or two uh you and i only have humans primates only one syringe so we can only uh emit one frequency of sound at any given microsecond millisecond <clears throat> but these thrashers can emit two if you look at these circled areas those are those are two bands of frequencies and they're not a harmonic harmonics are double the, the frequency of the lower band would be doubled up above in fact you can see a shadow of the harmonics up above barely on some of these uh samples and these are just samples from uh, a dozen or half dozen different males but i wanted you to listen to the quality of these doubled double, uh, two syrinxes emitting that same instant Yes, that is a cow mooing at the very end. I'm sorry, but Maricopa had cows, and some of my tapes would be a mama cow calling her calf. But you could hear the quality of the sound there. It's uh, a little raspy. Uh, you know, if somebody's singing out a tune in a choir, uh, the sound doesn't come out of the choir like you really want it to be. You want it to be in, in a harm, harmonic Mimics mimic. So of all the tapes that I made at, at Maricopa, here's a list of all the species that we could identify being mimicked by the thrashers. I want you to look at the bottom of the two the two columns there, the mockingbird and the ground squirrel. So listening to a the thrasher mimic a mockingbird, it's tripling some of the notes and a quality of that of the mockingbird. Normally, uh, the thrashers rarely, just rarely double, but never triple like the mockingbird does. Notice the red, I think that caught your eye, I'm sure. The red California scrub jay, well, if you folks in California know, they're restricted to the oaks, oak belts of the mountains. Uh, there in Cal or coastal areas of California. St. Maricopa, I don't, I have the foggiest idea what the nearest record of a scrub jay is, California scrub jay, is to Maricopa. It's gotta be 15 or 20 miles. And the thrashers certainly don't move up into those mountains. And I don't think scrub jays ever come down into the floor of the San Joaquin. So how they learn the scrub jay, I don't know. But I was also, of course, interested in how you, how uh, the real call of the, the originator and the mimic sound. So on the right here is the thrasher, and A is the quail. So I want you to listen. Hopefully, I trust now everybody's hearing these sounds. Quail, thrasher, quail, thrasher. The little box in the middle of the A there that uh, uh, covers the area that the thrashers were actually picking up and mimicking. They didn't have the full spectrum of sound that the quails were using. But to the human ear, and I don't know to another quail whether it would sound real, but uh, it certainly sounded real to my ear. I was interested in the display of the birds. Here's a bird, as you can see, just outside. Uh, my window and my van sitting on a oil well piece of piping uh, valve or something. This is called the bow fluff. The bird's bill is below its feet level. The bird's body is fluffed. Wings are spread a little bit. And the tail is fanned. And it is singing very quietly. Probably can only hear it 15 feet away, 20 feet away. 
this is basically the same display except the bird is now on the ground moving slowly along and singing but the bill is now up at a more horizontal plane again singing and we call this the shuffle fluff display here's another one called the male where the male does a bush dive into the shrub that he's sitting on and this takes five to seven seconds where he just slowly while he's singing slowly goes down in and disappears into the bush and you will notice uh, in numbers five and six and a little bit of seven uh, the view he presents to the speaker to the other bird there's another displays the mimics uh, thrashers are known and and mockingbirds are known for their spreading their wings wing flashing it's called here it is to a rattlesnake and i did a bunch of drawings then of the the bird the second row bird is in a quarter spread then it does a half spread uh holding it for a couple seconds and then a full spread for another couple seconds so it went through three stages all in a row and these are just other postures in front of the snake or a snake <clears throat> thrasher diet is 90 to 95 percent animal material arthropods are primarily but uh, small reptiles, bird eggs, I'll explain that, but only five or maybe 10% are is plant material. Seeds, uh, I have no evidence of eating cactus fruit, but I'm sure they must at some point. Uh, I did have uh, a specimen collected in an old date grove out uh, east of India, uh, and it was eating the dates in this abandoned date grove uh, but it still rarely ever sees or drinks water I, in 2000 hours out in the desert uh, watching these thrashers i never once saw them drink water i did once see them hop up on a concrete platform that had a skim of water on it and thought oh boy i'm going to finally get to see them drink instead they just went over and took baths didn't drink that was in the winter time when they need water is in the summer. Getting back to the bird's eggs, they will eat other thrasher eggs and any other bird eggs. If they find another nest without the adult on top of it and defending it, they will consume the other bird eggs. Uh, out of the dunes, this is very interesting. The little arthropods that spend the night out on the dunes running around, just before uh, sun comes up, they dig these their little burrows and bury themselves down into the sand to avoid the hot blazing sun. Thrashers are not particularly dumb. They see those little uh, tracks there and they say, ah, that tells me there's a arthropod of some sort or maybe even a little lizard buried in there. So they notice this is about 18 inches from that hole down to the very bottom. That's probably 18 inches that the sand got scattered. There's a close look up the hole, which is probably three, maybe four inches deep. And this is one of the things that they frequently would come up with. This is obviously taken out on the Algodonis doom, but these camel crickets, cave crickets, uh, variety of names for this family of crickets. That cricket probably has two, maybe even three grams of water in it. If they can find 40 or 50 of those in a day, which on the dunes where you see these tails are, would be pretty easy. That's over 100 grams of water for a 60 gram bird. So they have no problem finding water even in the middle of July. I was interested in whether uh, they primarily fed on small or large uh, bugs or ate uh, big bugs in particular. The red column is the number of individuals within the daily sample. And you can see the real little guys, these are the ants, aphids, things of that sort, uh, add almost no biomass, the blue bar uh, on the far left. But on the far right, you can now get into the grasshopper, uh, cricket, uh, 
centipedes, um, all sorts of large arthropods. And you can see they didn't eat very many of those, but they accounted for about 60% of their daily uh, biomass. There's still some puzzles, puzzles we uh, haven't figured out. As I mentioned, that uh, second lining, or excuse me, what is the benefit of the second lining? The first item there, I forgot, is uh, who's doing all the incubating and brooding at night? Is it males, females that vary with early part of the incubation or late part of the nestling period? What's going on there? And the third question that still remains really unresolved is are the thrashers in Mexico nesting much earlier? Uh, some specimens from uh, near the upper Gulf of Mexico, uh, California, taken at uh, the turn of last century in 1900, showed that the young thrashers that they collected hatched sometime around the 1st of December. The earliest nest record we have for the United States is 9 January. Most of them are after the 25th of January. There's only a couple before the 25th of January in the United States. So uh, still don't know what's going on in Mexico. In summary, uh, the uh, only 14 birds have been banded prior to this study. We banded uh, 353 in the three or four years. And then since the study, only another hundred have been banded by all the other banders in the United States and Mexico. From those banded bird, color banded birds, we learned a lot about their movements, pair bonds, social and individual behavior and interactions, and uh, learned from these just those thrashers. That's a lot of information we gained. The overall density is fairly low. These are predator specialists. They are excavators, only they're excavators of the ground. Underneath some of the salt bushes that they seem to favor there at Maricopa, it looked like uh, somebody, I won't say took a shotgun, but uh, there might be 50 little holes underneath one large salt bush where they were digging out the beetle larvae and the moth larvae, which were probably their dominant prey that they were digging out. I mean, they were certainly getting other things. Uh, the prey provides certainly all their water requirements, especially in the summertime. And it still remains a fairly elusive and hard to study bird. Uh, there's some groups that are still studying the birds and they're having a hard time finding them uh, even in areas they know they should be. So oh, it is an apparition that comes and it goes. Consider yourself fortunate if you can watch them for more than 20 or 30 minutes at a time. Uh, bird watchers came back to their ATV and discovered some thrashers in the shade. This is the middle of the summer. Since everybody's muted, I can't tell you read all that. But I assume you have. Here's the monograph uh, printed in 2018. 50 years and six months almost to the day from the start of the study, uh, we got this out of the printer. Phew. I get zero remuneration from any sale, so don't feel like I'm trying to sell this uh, if you want to get it, get it. I, you know, but I get don't even get a penny out of it, nothing. So that would normally be the end of the talk. Uh, but I came back to Maricopa in April of 2018 while we were proofreading the galleys on the monograph. And I was, uh, could only survey maybe 60% of the old study area because several of the old roads had washed out and not been uh, graded enough for my little uh, Dodge Caravan to go across. Uh, there was also some fencing that had been installed and I couldn't 
get through the fence. I was expecting to find maybe 20 or 30, and I looked seriously, were old or active nests, because they were usually pretty easy to find. I expected to find a dozen or two thrashers, but I found zero, heard none, saw none within the actual study area. I did finally find one just north of Maricopa outside the study area, but that was the only bird I actually saw. Uh, I did find two very old nests and one that might have been made that spring. Uh, again, this is the end of April. It had been a February nest and fledged in early March. Uh, it could have been that nest. The problem was, I think, the severe drought that you folks had had out there for the previous decade or so. There was a pair of common ravens now nesting literally in the middle of the study area on one of those bluffs, a little crev a crevasse had opened up and they were able to build a nest there. And they are big predators on any baby bird that they can see running around. And these nestling thrashers, by the way, don't start flying for at least a week after they've left the nest. And of course, a little bit too much of overgrazing, just a little too many cattle for too long a period on a very dry pasture because of the drought. If you remember that early picture of the study area, this is almost the exact same spot and there aren't any real viable salt bushes left around these water tanks. So the study area right now, if you go up there, isn't really suitable for any studies of Lacan thrashers unless we can reduce the grazing and get back to some normal rainfall. I know you folks in Santa Barbara have gotten a little more than normal rainfall so far this winter. Uh, a little too much at one time, I believe. Hopefully uh, you'll get a little more, but not as much as you already had. This was done with the help of a lot of people over the last 50 years. I want to repeat to all I am most grateful for their inputs and assistance. That's the end. Okay. Hope we didn't run too late. No, it, um, it's, you're right on schedule here. Really? Uh, yeah. Even with, with our flub in the middle? <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll look at the chat here. I see uh, from Gary. Does the Lacan's overlap with other types of thrasher in, thrashers in territory? That's a very interesting question. As far as I can tell, none of the thrashers cons included, will share a territory with any other species. We have found California thrashers and acons in adjacent territories, side by side, uh, out in the Mojave Desert, Bendar thrashers, acon thrashers, side by side. But we can't see where they're actually feeding and doing their own thing in the other's territory. Um, I'd like to study this a little bit more. It's a it's an unanswered question, but uh, as far as I can tell, it's uh, no, they don't share it. Uh, didn't find mockingbird. There was only one pair, two pairs of mockingbirds in downtown Maricopa. I never could find thrashers close enough to them, but so I can't really say they shared adjacent territories. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Catherine, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Jay, uh, Catherine says, Jay, can you talk about the decline of Lacan's thrasher? Why have the losses have why the have the losses have occurred in their range and at Maricopa since your study? Why? What can be done, if anything? Uh, do a rain dance if you know how. Uh, there, there really isn't a heck of a lot except for the, of course, a lot of the San Joaquin Valley 
especially north and and uh, east of i mean the birds used to occur all the way over to bakersfield in fact east of bakersfield uh at the foot of the Temblers and uh, greenhorn mountains uh, 150 years ago they were found over there they're now just in a few spots in the san joaquin valley and most mm -hmm. of it's because of the ag uh, especially after I, and I said it at the time while i was doing the study the california aqueduct was being built and completed and i said once they can pump water uphill from the aqueduct onto the west slope of the san joaquin valley that's going to doom you know half the thrashers or more and that's what's happened uh the area is just to the east of taft mckittrick uh all the way up to coalinga you know that's all gone uh mostly because of uh, big ag. Uh, there's been some development in the San Joaquin Valley that certainly reduced the number. And, and the overgrazing right there at Maricopa, that was a problem. If you go, if you want to see the contractors at Maricopa, just go north about a half a mile to a petroleum road and go east. And you should be able to find them there without too much difficulty. As for other areas, uh, it's certainly the sprawl, uh, the San Gregonio Pass, uh, Palm Springs, uh, other similar areas, uh, the Coachella Valley, uh, those areas have just been uh, developed too much. And so that they, you add water, your golf courses and the contractors don't mix. Uh, nice green fairways, too much water, too much water. And they they disappear, and actually out in the San, in the uh, Indio area, uh, crystal thrashers and California thrashers are even starting. I, I heard move out into the uh, around Palm Springs there, some of those irrigated areas. Good question. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, there's a, another one that I'm trying to get to. In another talk. You mentioned several factors contributing to their decline. I only recall the increase in ravens. Are there other causes? In another talk? Yeah. It must have been one of our audience here has seen another talk. Uh, of yours. Well, that's the only predator right there at Maricopa that had, had appeared. The uh, ravens, when I was there, nested up in the foothills a couple miles away. So they weren't literally looking down from their nest at the nests of Lacan thrashers. I mean, this pair that's moved in is literally 25 feet looking down into the nests mm -hmm. of what would, or where the nests used to be of Lacan thrashers. Uh, ravens uh, are certainly predators throughout the range of this and all, all the other songbirds out there. So. That's not unusual. It's just that right at Maricopa, we, we got this one pair, plus the combined additional cattle pressure and drought. And it just, I had been out there in the early 90s. That was the last, previous to 2018. I'd been out there in the early 90s. There were lots of thrashers in, in uh, 1993, 94, somewhere along in there. I went out one morning and had like 15 birds calling at one time, you know, so. Or within 20 minutes um lots of birds then but not now okay um how did you come to choose maricopa as your study area david is asking uh, well that was because of this or to a series of, of events where i banded a bird i was still on active duty in the navy uh in march of 67 stopped by there discovered a family uh the brood had just gotten out of the nest caught all the babies caught the adults banded them went back the following year the same spot and whoa there's two banded thrashers at the same spot so i quickly put up nets and caught them again and verified yes those are the two adults not one of the young uh from the previous year and uh, I was now out of the Navy and I thought I was gonna do some studies down in uh, Seal Beach, Long Beach area where I was doing in graduate school. And this suddenly discovered that there was this big population of thrashers around Maricopa. I had a nice camper that I could camp in 
every night while I was out there. I, you know, it was admittedly two hours from Long Beach. That was when the traffic was a little easier in the LA basin. Uh, probably be a three hour drive as I understand it now. <laughs> yeah. So is that uh, how you, what attracted you to studying the Leconte thrashers in the first place? What, what? Well, I knew that I knew at the time I banded those, that family that it was a very rare banding. I already knew that they had rarely ever been banded before. Uh, I had tracked the numbers of lots of species. And even though I was living there in California, and I knew that Lacan's was a very rarely, if ever, banded bird. So to discover so it was so easy to band these two and come back the next year and then discover more birds very close by it, you know it just sort of made itself here was all these nesting adults and uh and lucky like i said i didn't have any choices to deal with uh, that i didn't realize until years later yeah. and okay uh oh uh getting back to ravens I, uh in a talk to Maryland Audubon Society, you talked about the incredible increase in ravens in the desert. So that was what drove the other question. Oh. Yes, out of the Mojave Desert, just as I was leaving in the very early 70s, uh, people started seeing, in fact, I saw one of the earliest flocks of ravens where you know several hundred uh, ravens could be seen together at one time. And uh, that was very unusual up until the late 60s early 70s and as i understand it now big flocks and roosts of ravens out in the mojave are certainly uh harassing if not consuming large numbers of desert tortoise and all other small vertebrates that they can find so yes that was true out in the hello doug or jim uh whoever <laughs> From Maryland Audubon, Maryland Audubon, okay. OS. <laughs> uh, let's see, I'm looking to make sure I caught everything here. Uh, I've got a couple of people saying thank you, quite interesting. They enjoyed uh, the sounds. Um, I have a question. I did see that you had, you said you'd done some drawings of thrashers. There were some line drawings of thrashers in different positions. Did you do those? Or did somebody else do those? No, I did those, but they were done with the aid of a projector and the slides. I projected mm -hmm. the slide up onto a screen and then traced out the outline of the of the bird. I, that's oh. not freehand. Those are not freehand drawings. I'm sorry if I misled anybody. Oh, I have no John James Audubon or David Allen Sibley. <laughs> Oh, I have a question for Jane. Okay, uh, Roman, Roman has a question. How many of you knew Fred Sibley? Is there anybody on the, I would like to, you know, Fred was there in Ventura. He was the condor biologist for Audubon uh, back in my day, back in the 60s. Oh. And, I, and he's still a friend or up in Connecticut now. <laughs> Go ahead. Jay, Sorry. Jay you, had, you mentioned that you had done some work with uh, California condor. Can you... Uh, well, that was when I was an official wildlife. Well, I helped on a couple. They had condor counts back in those days when there was only 30 or 40. Or there was a big argument back in the 60s whether there was 40 birds or 60 or 70 birds. And, you know, it didn't make any difference. There weren't very many damn birds back in those days. There still aren't a lot of birds. Um, but when I worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service, I helped work on the recovery plan and the idea of trying to get some birds into the Grand Canyon because historically or almost historically, they were there. Uh, my own personal feeling is the Thunderbird of the Southwest Indians is really the thunder from a, the pop of a condor uh, that does at times in its displays. Uh, I don't know the golden eagle or anything else that makes that popping sound. It might. I've never heard them. Uh, but at any rate, I, so I was working on the recovery plan uh, back in the early 70s, middle 70s, early 80s to help increase the numbers. 
Wow. But that I was have... here in Washington. I, I had no hands on. I mean, I got to play with the the one captive uh, back in the 60s, early 70s at the LA Zoo. Uh, Frank Todd was the curator there, a fellow graduate student of Long Beach. And that was a very interesting bird. I mean, talk about intelligent. That bird could look you over and tell where your belt buckle was and your shoelace was and and start tugging on your shoelaces. And <laughs> all kind of, it was very, very intelligent bird, very in, in, entertaining. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, there's a, another question in the chat. Jay, there are a lot of restoration advocates in Santa Barbara County and a bunch of birders who lament the loss of breeders in Santa Barbara County. Is there a habitat restoration option that might entice thrashers to so, areas where they... Well, um, as far as I work. know, there are no nest records for Santa Barbara County. Uh, I have one of the, and a couple other friends at, at different times uh, back in the 60s, saw them only a couple hundred yards into Santa Barbara County. If you look up where the Ventucopa Ranger Station is in the Kiyama Valley, it was just near there, but still just very close to the Ventura line where I had a singing bird. They were nesting in the ephedra, the Mormon tea in that little corner of Ventura County, excuse me, not Ventura, uh, yeah, that's San Luis Obispo, isn't it? No, wait, what's the other county over there? My mind just, not. Kern? Kern County? No, 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 no. the Ventura. one that Kiyama is in. What's Kiyama? What county is Kiyama in? It's in Ventura County. Um, what? Uh, San Luis, San Luis Obispo? Is that San Luis Obispo? I guess it is. I guess it Borderline. is. Okay. Yeah. You know, too many counties, right? They all come together right there yeah. at that the Kuyama Valley, Maricopa Nexus. Um, but at any rate, uh, there was a small band. I, I never got into it. Uh, a BLM biologist named Sam Fitton found them in the late 70s, nesting in a very narrow, few hundred yard wide strip that ran for a couple of miles. Uh, over towards the highway that goes over to Maricopa. And that was the only place, the closest nesting. There is no place I can imagine that they would nest. Oh, yes, there is. I just remembered. Uh, the actual Kuyama River bottom, the sand of that bottom, if it doesn't get flooded too often and a few thrashers show up, I wouldn't be surprised nesting on the sandbars or on the immediate banks of the river in Santa Barbara County would be a, the one place I would look. It's all private land, so you're going to have to get uh, permission to go mm -hmm. wandering in there. But uh, that that I've looked at least on Google Earth, which is my favorite tool on the internet, practically. Uh, that is a very high possibility, but it, no habitat restoration. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks to Gary Milliken. He says Kuyama is in Santa Barbara County. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Roman, did you have a question? Well, Kuyama Valley, the upper end, but the county line, I thought, goes across above the town of Kuyama. There's a county line there, and you drive on down the valley there, you're no longer in Santa Barbara. Maybe I'm well, uh, I, I have a question for you, Jay, but um, I also am sensitive to, I believe it's getting close to 1030 in, at night your time. So I stay up till midnight often, so it's no big deal. Well, your dedication and your knowledge of LaConche Thrasher and the work that you've done with fish and wildlife is incredibly admirable. And I think the legacy uh, of your research is absolutely invaluable. So personally, and I think I probably speak for a lot of people want to thank you for all of that, what you've done. I'm, I'm just curious myself, like, how did you first become interested in, in birds? What, what was it growing up in Cincinnati that got you interested? Uh, from my earliest memory, probably age three, maybe a little 
younger than maybe even three, my grandmother would take me fishing in the river that ran through her farm uh, in Western Ohio. And when you're sitting on the bank or on the bridge fishing and there's no bites going on, what else do you do? You look at the birds in the bushes around you. And she was a very avid nature watcher. And so she would start pointing out the yellow throats and the robins and the orioles and things. And so I can, I, my life list goes back to about age seven. Wow. And. Uh, well, uh, we are extremely, extremely grateful. And uh, Jay, I really, really appreciate the presentation and um, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> I'll stay on as long as it, if anybody wants to leave, fine. I don't care. Uh, if anybody wants to stay on, I'm, I say I stay up until 1130 midnight uh, on a regular basis. So this is normal time. All right. Great. Well, Jesse says, thank you so much. And we, uh, we all say thank you so much, Jay. Does anybody have any questions? Let me see. Somebody's Steve, waiting. Did Steve Rothstein get on? I, I didn't look at the list of participants. I did not see Steve on here. Um, we'll let him know about we'll the recording for the sure. Recording, definitely. Okay. Oh, wait. I talked on. to Steve and he said to say hello to you, Jay. He could oh. not attend. I understand. Yeah. It's, it's like scheduling anything else. Yeah. Herding cats or scheduling cats to be herded. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for saying that. All right. And many thanks to Mark as well for the great suggestion. Much appreciated. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Carrizo Plain ideas. Oh, yeah. Carrizo Plain's a good spot to go. Yeah. Uh, on the east side, up on the bench ab above the Soda Lake there, you, you have to get over into the salt bush. Yeah, we were just up at Soda Lake and right after the big rainstorms, and it was amazing how big Soda Lake was. Actually had it water was, in it? Oh, geez. It, full. it full. Yeah. Whoa. Amazing. Yeah. Whoa. So anyway, all right. Uh, I don't see anything else, but a lot of thank yous for the great talk, uh, Jay. And thank you for st having, spending an evening with us. It's great. All right. Thank all you, right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Take you, good everyone. care. Thank you all.